another mini home audio amplifier with TPA 3255 chip and SQ parts? Let's find out more. Duke Audio recently sent over their TPA 3255 based amplifier, the A100, for an independent review. So let's uh, see what it's about. Here is the box. Let's get it open and find out what's inside. And first thing here in the box is the information slash warranty card. Tells you about the warranty service and who to contact. Also, we have the user's manual, which is a quad fold, small little document here. Gives you additional information about the amp. We have a US power cord, and we have the power supply. This is a 48 volt, five amp, or 240 watt power supply. Now, you may have noticed in previous videos, I've shown the TPA 3255 based amplifiers with a 48 volt, 10 amp power supply which would be twice as big as the one we have here. So that right off the bat, that's kind of a limitation as this amp can probably use a bigger power supply, but it does come with the 240 watt one. Here on the amp, you can see across the front, we have four knobs and we have two switches. So not a whole lot going on here. This amp features post filter feedback technology, which reduces distortion, enhances linearity and frequency response, improves sound purity, and system efficiency. It also utilizes four layer premium immersion gold PCB, Rubicon, Elena, and German WEMA capacitors and high precision potentiometers. It also offers stereo or mono operation, a 3.5 millimeter aux output with an independent volume control, in addition to a low pass filter as well as a bass gain feature when used as mono amplifier. Also, for the discerning sound quality fan, we have swappable op amps that includes any 5532s that are swappable with 8-pin dual op amps like the Muse 2 and the OPA2604. Ratings with the included power supply for stereo, 8 ohms, 102 watts per channel, or 4 ohms, 120 per channel. On the front of the amp, two switches, the first one for stereo, mono, or off. Also, we have a flat or sub switch. We have the power LED. We have the base cutoff frequency knob or subwoofer frequency. We have a super bass adjustment, an aux volume, and the main volume. Again, important to note the subwoofer frequency and super bass volume controls are only active when the amplifier is in the sub mode. Now looking at the back side of the amplifier, we have audio input jacks via RCAs. We have a 3.5 millimeter auxiliary output, which will go to your separate amplifier or powered speakers powered subwoofer, etc. Beside that, we have your speaker outputs via binding post, aka five-way binding posts, which means they can accept banana plugs, bare wire, or other options. Also on the far right, we have 24 volt to 48 volt DC input to use with the included adapter, of course. As for dimensions, 5.9 inches for the width, 5.6 inches for the depth, and 2.3 inches for the height. Millimeter equivalents are there as well for those who are outside the US. Now we have the amp ready to hook up to the amp dyno so we can find out the true output power. Let's fire up the SMD to more engineering amplifier dyno, get the amp connected up. If you haven't seen these tests before on the left, you'll see the power output in watts in the middle, the ohm load on the right, the voltage of the dyno. And since this is not a car audio amplifier, this is not relevant for these tests since the amplifier is powered by its own power supply. The dyno is powered by a battery bank. First off, let's try stereo tests for the amplifier, eight ohms. Rated 102 watts by two, using the 48 volt five amp power supply. Let's find out what we get. Certified, you notice it counts up to a certain point around 38 to 40 watts and it just stops. And then it jumps to 67 at the end. So we'll say it doesn't count cleanly over about 40 watts per channel. However, uncertified takes us up to the clipping point. And watch this, see if we can get that 102. Look at that. <laughs> 129 watts and 125 watts per channel here. So definitely up to the clipping point, it does its rated power plus some. What about dynamically sending that pulse tone of one kilohertz into the amplifier? You can see 
easily does the rated power actually does more about 125 watts per channel Next up, we'll try the 4 ohm stereo test, which is rated 120 watts by 2 using that 48 volt 5 amp power supply. We use a 1 kilohertz track here, certified test up to 1% distortion. Again, notice it stops at 80 and 75, and then at the end jumps way up, 178 and 170. That's very interesting. So it looks like he hits that 1% distortion before. Uh, it really should, but let's try it uncertified. That takes us up to the clipping point. And as you can see here, we're getting those big numbers well beyond what the amp is rated. Here you can see about 220 watts per channel. Again, that's 440 watts from a 240 watt power supply. You might ask, how is this possible? Well, I wondered the same thing in a previous video, so I went over it and talked about how it's possible. So check the link in the video description if you want to see that, back to the music. Next up, we're going to try the amp in the mono mode by flipping the switch on the front to mono and then using these two outer terminals, the left plus and right plus option. So let's try it out here. Eight ohms. It's not rated anywhere in the manual or anywhere I could find online, but let's try it out. Certified test takes us up to 1% distortion and let's find out what we get. Looks like it stops at 40 and just like the previous test jumps to up to 94 in this case. So uh, yeah, again, it doesn't do these certified tests clean, which means it's more than 1% distortion. Let's try it uncertified though, that takes us up to the clipping point, see what we get. And there you go, over 100 watts, keeps counting. 129 at eight ohms bridge. Now dynamic power sends a pulse track. It's like the IHF 202 test, tests the dynamic capability of the amplifier. And here you can see, 126 watts, 8 ohms bridge dynamically. Now let's try this out with a subwoofer, see how it sounds. Most impressive there with the JL Audio subwoofer now. Let's try it 4 ohms mono because that was a 3 ohm sub. Let's see what we get here. Certified at 1% distortion, 1 kilohertz. There again, it stops at 77 and it jumps at the end of the test to 100 watts more, 176. Now, according to the manual, what I found online, it's rated 315 watts. So let's try it here, uncertified to clipping and see if we can get that 315. Here we go, it keeps counting, and not quite. We get 249 at four ohms uncertified here using the 48 volt five amp power supply. Again, we're getting more power out of it than it actually is uh, rated, but again, that's just possible due to the dynamic nature of these tests. Dynamically, 243 watts. Let's try the woofer test. Now 
Now finally here for the test, 2 ohms mono rated 600 watts at 51 volts according to the ratings. We have a 48 volt power supply which is only supplying about 240 watts. Certified here, you can see it stops at 144 but jumps to 336 which makes me really interested to see what it's going to do uncertified up to the clipping point. So let's watch this, see how much over 330 watts we get and check this out. 425 watts at 2 ohms using a 240 watt power supply. Yes, if they had a bigger power supply, I would try that. But since the amp doesn't come with one, or I didn't see the option, then we didn't even test it with the bigger power supply. Dynamically, 406 watts at 2 ohms. Nice. All right, here are the results from all the tests, 8 ohms, 4 ohms, and we didn't show the 2 ohm test, but if you stick to the end of the video, you can see the 2 ohm stereo test. And here's the bridge mono test. Again, 1% distortion, it did not meet its ratings, but the other ones it did pretty good, except for the 2 ohm rating. We know we're not gonna get that 600 watts with this power supply. So now let's take the screws off of the amp here so we can get inside and see what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so once I got all the screws out, I must say this was a frustrating experience trying to get the amp board to slide out because the binding post here on the back kept getting in the way. I think you really needed to take the binding post off, uh, which have some screws on the back, but they're glued in and I could not get those to loosen up easily. So I just got frustrated and said, you know, what the heck, we're not <laughs> going to take these off. They should not make it this difficult to get into, but it, it does open up enough for you to get to the op amps, which I'll show those here in a minute, but you can see the Rubicon capacitors and the Elena capacitors and all the good quality components here. And here you can see the place where you can get to those op amps to swap out if you want to. Now let's move on to the pros and cons, things I like, things I think could be better. Obviously stereo and mono capable, has a low pass crossover, a variable bass boost if you use the mono function, TPA 3255 amp modules, which in my opinion are the best things for the mini amps on the market right now. It does have five-way binding posts and an auxiliary output hook up to another amp or powered speakers. Things to consider, the value is about $200, not the best value in my opinion. Rated versus actual power with the 1% distortion mode. No Bluetooth and the aux out is only a separate volume. It does not vary with the main volume. There's no remote. You may need the 48 volt 10 amp power supply and the RCA input voltage needed, in my case, almost six volts of input. What this means is you may not get the full output of this amplifier using a standard source, like a CD player, MP3 player, etc. You need something that has a large amount of RCA voltage output. Not sure why that's the case with this amp because it says it runs with two volts of input. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure you smash me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, Big D, I'm out of here. Yeah. As promised, we'll try the 2 ohm stereo test. There are no ratings provided. Let's find out what it does here. Certified using the 1 kilohertz track. Once again, stops around 140 and then jumps up to between 220 and 277. So let's try it up to the clipping mode. See if that channel 2 is still stronger than the first one or if that was just a fluke due to the jump there. And here you can see 304 and 325 over 600 and right at 630 watts total. What about dynamic power? Again, well over 600 watts here. Pretty crazy from a 240 watt power supply. Makes you really want to know how it do with the big one. Thanks as always for watching.